Hi Roger, thank you for joining Opus 93. Thanks for having me, Tigran. Um, so just to start off, let's uh, hear a little bit about your start in the music and uh, how it all started. Well, what, do you really want to know about me starting music or starting in composition? Because well, music. You know, I'm, I'm relatively old now, so it's a long story. But um, no, I um, obviously did a lot of singing in church and stuff like that. I um, started the piano lessons when I was in third grade. And I had the, my, my sister is two years older than me. I had the same piano teacher, and I had to use my sister's hand-me-down books, and she had me do the exact same exercises, and I absolutely hated it. So, um, in the school system that uh, I was in when I was in grade school, they started um, kids on string instruments for fifth grade. So, at the end of the fourth grade year, the music teacher that would go around all the schools and teach the strings um, did like a, he came in and did a, a had a film, you know, just like get everybody's interest. So I got, I was like, this is my way out of piano lessons, you know. And so I'm going to play the cello. So I um, started playing the cello and that actually did get me out of piano lessons. And I played the cello and then when I was in middle school, I continued playing the cello, but I also wanted to be, I wanted to play a wind instrument. I really wanted to play the oboe and the English horn, and especially the English horn, and the whole cluster of things. I had just gotten braces and my parents like were harboring themselves into this urban legend that, you know, if you play something that you have to like touch your teeth while you have braces, it's going to ruin your teeth forever, you know, and stuff. So um, I wanted to get an instrument. They, they decided to let the band director decide what it was I was going to play. I went in to get an instrument, and he had in this very large, very smelly, beat-up case. And I opened it up. I didn't even know what it was. And it was a euphonium. Huh. So I played the euphonium, and because I was good at it, they made me switch over to tuba because they didn't have any good tuba players. So I got stuck playing tuba and I hated that. <laughs> and um, then I, um, I bought myself an alto sax from a friend who had one that her sister had had and didn't play any more stuff. And I, I paid 75 bucks, I like saved up $75 and taught myself a saxophone and didn't break my teeth. And <laughs> From there, I finally was allowed to play the oboe, and I, I played. I was, on, I was like a total geek, and I played every instrument I could get my hands on when I was a kid back then. And then when I went to college, I was majoring in oboe, and I had a um, accompanist my first year in college who had two obsessions. He was a great pianist, and he had two obsessions, Stravinsky and Steve Reich. And I had never heard of minimalist music or anything like that. And you know, I'm just from Oklahoma, and I didn't have like um, a family that was like really involved in the arts or anything. So it was like the idea of being a composer or anything, like, I just didn't get that, uh, you know. And they insisted like go to college in my hometown, and I was living out. It was just, you know, it wasn't it wasn't for me. But so um, so my my accompanists, um Stephen Bone, um, he was obsessed with strings. He also was a, a, a visual artist, and um, he had drawn a big copy of that um, Picasso line drawing portrait of Stravinsky and hung it up on the wall in the practice room that he used. Right, you know, it was like locked key for piano majors, and they all had their one piano that they liked to practice on. So. Um, there was that, and then he started telling me about this weird phase music by this guy named Steve Reich, and um, we went into like an open practice room that had multiple pianos in it and tried to play some. I, I didn't get it, but I was very intrigued with the idea, and um, that kind of got me thinking about composing, and um, then, I went over to his house one time, he lived with his brother, they looked like twins, but they were actually separated by year, his brother was getting into philosophy. And they had like no furniture, <laughs> folding chairs. 
because they spent all of their extra money on music and art. And it was really cool. And he played me the Steve Reich octet in like the original recording of Steve Reich and musicians. And that kind of set me on a whole, whole course. But there's actually another story about the first time I wrote music, which is prior to going to college. Uh -huh. So in high school, I did a lot of things besides music. Um, and one of the things I did was I was on the debate team. Uh -huh. And I was in, uh, I crewed in one play and I acted in one play. And between that, um, I had a friend who was like the funniest guy in school. His name is Robert. And, um, you know, Robert was just like, he was always on, he was always funny. Sometimes it was really annoying, but he was hysterical. And um, so we, we were in this college town, right? And we were hanging out on a Saturday one time. and. You know, there's nothing to do. He's like, well, let's go to campus and let's go bang around on the piano. So we went to the building where the music department was and went downstairs into the basement where the practice rooms are. You know, this is back in like 1980 and there wasn't like a sense of security or anything like that. Anybody could just walk in, you know. And so we were like playing around on the piano. So he's like, let's write a song. And I'm like, Robert, we don't know how to write a song. <laughs> he's like, oh, no, 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 we'll just do it. I'll make up words and you can just make up music. Play the piano. And you know, I'm not a pianist. Um, so together we wrote this really stupid song. And um, so I was on the debate team and in the forensic league and had done a little acting. And so I was also in the Thespians Club. And Robert was in the same organizations. And the two organizations together you always had a year in banquet. And he's like, we're going to do this song at the NFL Thespians Club. <laughs> and oh, he was like, wanted to be all dramatic and Broadway about you know wanting to be an actor and it's like sort of calmed me down. But so we actually did it at the banquet and we got up there and I was at the piano and Robert started telling this this introduction about how we wrote the song, except for he left out the part that I actually wrote it with him. <laughs> and so I had to correct him in front of everybody that we wrote the song, not he wrote the song. And that was the first piece of music I ever wrote. But you know, like, it was just a one-off. I never ever thought about it, you know? And it was just dumb and... Yeah, so that's how I got started. So, uh, I, I read that you, you went to CalArts. That must have been a complete culture shock and composition shock. That school seems to have so many new experiences or new, new ways to compose and play music. When I was in high school, um, at least at that time, I don't know if they still do it anymore, but like essentially all public school kids across the nation took the PSAT in high school. And I got really good marks on it, and so I started getting repertoire, uh, not repertoire, um, brochures and stuff from all these colleges around the world, and I checked that I was interested in being a music major. And so I actually got a brochure from CalArts. I didn't remember much about it except for there was this thing where they filled a whole room with water. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. You know, I didn't understand it, but I thought, wow, that's really cool. And then, you know, I went to music school, and it took me a long time to get through my undergraduate degree because uh, first I went to a school that um, told me they had a program they didn't have, and then, you know, I switched and switched back, and then I wanted to be a composer, and they didn't have that, and blah, 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 blah. So many years later, I was applying for graduate schools, and I was under the impression at the time that I had to get a doctorate, and, you know, CalArts, Private school doesn't offer doctorates, although I guess they offer a doctorate now. But um, so I wasn't even thinking about schools that didn't offer doctorate degrees because I thought I had to go that path. And um, I was like looking at all these programs, and it all made me feel like I had cancer. You know, like you have to take out this foreign language and blah blah. I'm like, no, I want to write music. I need to write music and have experience writing music and making music, and not worry about all this bibliographies and stuff. And talking to a friend of mine, and he said, well, you should apply to Mills College, you know, and I knew all about Mills College and everything, and Darius and Yo and Barry O'Brien yeah. and all that sort of stuff, and I thought to myself, you know, he's right. This was a, another composer major uh, at my school, that was being my undergraduate from the University of Oklahoma, and uh, he actually had taken his degree and was getting his master's in composition at the time, and um, I thought to myself, gee, if I can apply to Mills, I can apply to CalArts. That's where I really want to go anyway. And so I applied to both. Those were the only two schools I applied to. I got accepted to both. But, and you know, Mills offered me money and CalArts didn't. And they're both very expensive private schools, but I was like, no. Hands down, I have to go to CalArts. Okay, so 
I was an older student when I got to CalArts, and I had actually explored, you know, chance music and extended techniques and all sorts of stuff like that. And you know, I worked in a record store and had you know like a thousand albums and all that sort of stuff. So like, as far as like different styles and all that, I didn't have a problem with it. Um, because I tried all that stuff, and you know, some of it I really enjoyed, but some of me, some of it I didn't, and um, it's not necessarily the style of music that I write, but I, it's not styles I don't listen to or don't appreciate or whatever. Um, and the great thing about Cal Arts, and and sort of to answer your question, which was really about the culture shock of going to Cal Arts, I mean, yes, moving to Southern California from Oklahoma and going straight to an all art school. There's culture shock there, but the main thing was that I had been around universities all my life because I grew up in a college town. My obo teacher was on the faculty. I did, you know, band stuff and orchestra stuff. I played in the college orchestra when I was in high school. I was just all sorts of stuff like that. Right? Everybody was a doctor, or a professor, all that sort of stuff. I went to Cal Arts. Everybody is a professional artist, and everybody's on a first name basis, and everybody's work is as good as anybody else's, and we're all collaborating together, even though it's school. And that was the real culture shock. And um, it really sort of clocked the way that I function as an artist to this day. You know, and it, Cal Arts um, is a place that encourages collaboration and uh, multidisciplinary work and stuff. And in many ways, I was sort of a bad fit because I pretty much do traditional instrumental composition. Right. Um, but it was the perfect place for me because I have always been the person that colors outside the lines and then says, you know what, screw this, just let me give me a blank piece of paper, I want to do what I want to do. Yeah, so, so it, musically, no, there wasn't anything that I hadn't been exposed to or read about or whatever going on, but just the whole thing of being in a community with nothing but arts. And that is a mind blowing experience, I think, for everybody that really has their eyes open. So, with all these experiences, you must have some mentors or teachers that really inspired. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, my teacher that I studied with for three years when I went back to finish my undergraduate degree at OU, Carolyn Bremer, um, did so much for me as a composer and as a person. And. You know, we're friends to this day. She is now, she's from Southern California, and she actually has her undergraduate degree from Cal Arts and her um, master's and doctorate from UC Santa Barbara. Um, she actually is down at Cal State Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And so we get together on a regular basis. She's had me be guest artist at their composer seminar, and you know, I go hear concerts that has her, her work on it or whatever, and I've actually um, plugged her pieces to um, organizations I've been involved with and you know, I've got cursive performances and stuff and she's you know not only a great um, musical mentor friend but she's also a great um, person to share with on you know cooking and all sorts of stuff you know um, I had so many amazing um, teachers slash collaborators slash mentors at CalArts um, Susie Allen who uh, is a harpist and improviser and amongst other things and I worked very closely with her when I was at Cal Arts. I wrote my first orchestra piece, I wrote a concerto for her. She premiered a piece of mine in New York City while I was still there at school. Um, and, and most of those people I still communicate with or you know have you know anytime I need something I can call them and I, you know I try to get work for uh, performers that I was with at school. Um, I had a, an amazing composition teacher who actually conducted some of my works, Art Jarvin, who was a founding member of California Air Unit and was in the Air Unit for like 20 years or something. Um, and his music and my music completely polar opposites, but he was like the best composition teacher I ever had because Primarily, all he ever did was ask questions. Um, and the questions that he asked were so probing and insightful that 
just and, and when I was at Cal Arts, I, I didn't do the you study with one person thing. I was like, I've done that. So I studied with a different composition teacher every semester. And a couple of semesters, I actually took more than one composition lesson, so I had several teachers, um, which was really great because it exposed me to all sorts of different viewpoints and everything. Of that time, I was there, and I studied with amazing, amazing artists. Art was above and beyond all of them. Unfortunately, he's uh, no longer in this world, so I can't, um, you know, have a, you know, relationship with him anymore. But the things that he asked me and the things that we did in my lessons and you know, he conducted some of my music with the ear and stuff. Those experiences are priceless. As a composer, there must be composers that have inspired you and you have tried to look into composing like or maybe getting some things from such composers for well, you? Well, you know, everybody steals. Um, <laughs> and of course there are a lot of composers that I just their music just speaks to me so so deeply, and I take things from. But you know, it's interesting what you steal, and you know you've stolen, and everybody else doesn't, and what you don't steal, but everybody thinks that you did. So um, my music, ninety percent of it is completely diatonic, and I have a lot of non. Maybe it's wrong with um, I use, you know, a lot of fourths and fifths. Um, and people will say, oh, well, that sounds like Copeland. And, you know, Aaron Copeland wrote great music. And there are pieces that, like, I cry because I will never be able to write them um, of his. But if you ask me who I'm emulating or taking from, I'll tell you. Roy Harris, I'll tell you Walter Piston, I'll tell you um, Andrew Poppy, I'll tell you stuff from Michael Torkey or whatever. People don't hear those things because generally they don't know the repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, like, there's a section of the Harris Third Symphony that I've written my versions of in multiple pieces. Mm -hmm. And not a single person would ever say that because nobody listens to that piece, even though it's you know, absolutely incredible. And there's multiple recordings and it gets played, but you know, people don't know it. Mm -hmm. So, so I, the, my next question was going to be if you paid homage to any composer. So obviously oh, you yeah. have. So. Well, and the other thing is, you know, I not only pay homage to like, you know, classical composers that have um, affected me, but there's always some sort of pop music that I grew up with in my pieces. People don't necessarily know. Same thing, you know, but. Um, I put things from Spandau Ballet, from um, ACT, and from all sorts of things in my pieces, you know, but you do them in such, if, if, if you're um, really creating your own work, you do them in a way so that you know that that's what it is, and you kind of don't want other people to know what it is, unless it's something that's supposed to provoke that exact response. Um, but yeah, you know, you know, where I'll put in, you know, something from a famous, you know, or not necessarily famous, although probably because I'm not as well versed in the repertoire, but some, you know, great jazz thing or whatever, you know, yeah, you have to. Like, how can you, we've all been exposed to other things. How can they not come out in it? Yeah. So I know the, this is kind of jumping forward, but I know your long history with Cal Phil, mm -hmm. California Philharmonic, and you've composed for them yeah and what's the relation how have you uh, been associated with the Philharmonic and the music director well I started okay so when I was at CalArts I um, amongst I had like five jobs when I was at CalArts in addition to going to school I was essentially working full-time but I was working full-time by cobbling together a whole bunch of part-time jobs and stuff and one of my jobs was I um, was a TA for uh, Julie Phoebus, who is a uh, bassoonist, and um, in musicianship skills. And so I would teach class for Julie once a week. Um, and Julie also uh, is an assistant. I, I can never remember whether it's assistant or associate dean. Same with Susie Allen, who I mentioned earlier. 
they're deans of the music school, and they have the A word in front of them, but which one I can never um, remember. But Julie um, handles all, or I, I assume she's still doing it, handles all the financial aid for all the students in the music school. And so I've been teaching for her for like a year and a half, and um, was going into my third year at CalArts, and um, she also taught the, a musician's career class. And she um, was asking me something about it, and I said, you know, Julie, I've been down in our student affairs office and looking at all the um, internship stuff, um, because next year I really need to get an internship and do something professional um, with an arts organization, and we don't have anything for music students. It's all out of date. The organizations don't exist anymore, nobody's maintained it and everything, and, and because she handled all everybody's financial aid, she knew exactly what I had, which was primarily work study and student loans, and she said, well, you have work study money, I'm just going to call them and tell them they're creating a position for you, and all you're going to do is develop internships for music students, and so she did just that, God love her, and I went down to the student affairs office where I didn't really know anybody, and the woman who was in charge of all that sort of stuff was a very stern um, Swiss lady named Wilhelmina. Mm. And I walked in and she told me, because she's very upfront with everybody, she said, I don't want you here. And I don't like having deans call me and tell me they have to create a position and take it out of my budget and blah, 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 blah. Um, Wilhelmina turned out to be another mentor. Um, and, but I spent a whole year doing, developing uh, internships for music students and uh, one of the things I did was I came up with a big list of music nonprofits throughout LA County. And I did a big mail out saying, uh, you know, I'm running from CalArts, we have music students that do all these different things, we'd like to develop internships, and, um, you know, how can we help you all by providing you with some, you know, free work? And very few organizations responded. But the first one that did was CalPhil. And at the time, CalPhil had done two seasons. Um, and they asked me to come to their offices in Pasadena and tell them all about the students we had and what kind of um, opportunities they could develop out of it. And um, so I did and had lunch with the maestro and uh, general manager and volunteer director and one of the volunteers and the ticket person. And talked and talked and talked and when I left, the maestro said, well, why don't you come back next week and be our intern? And the general manager said, no, don't. And so I left thinking I didn't have a job, and I was very crushed about that, because what I wanted was an internship with an orchestra, and um, you know, it had been dangled in front of my face, and I didn't have it. And um, so I had um, Fridays off that I, I arranged my schedule so I had Fridays off so I could devote an entire day to an internship once a week. And uh, I was out of pocket that next Friday for whatever reason and the student affairs office couldn't reach me via telephone. And they got a call from Cal Phil wondering why I hadn't shown up for my internship. <laughs> so after we ironed that out, I started going down and working for Cal Phil every week. Um, and my store had me do stuff like um, come up with a list of all the repertoire that CalPhil was going to be doing that summer that they could send out to all the musicians that they could use for the library work. He had me do some library work. Um, at the time, CalPhil was recording a um, CD of wind music by Mozart and uh, Richard Strauss. And they had me write the program notes for it. You know, so like I got all sorts of really cool opportunities. And um, so that was my final semester while I was at CalArts, and as graduation was coming up, I, you know, was in a total panic because, what do you do with, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in student debt and a degree in writing music, you know? <laughs> like, um, but one of the things I found out because I um, TA for the lady who administered the student aid for music students was that when you have federal student um, work study money, that's, that work study money isn't on the academic calendar of the school you go to, it's on a federal fiscal year, which is from, I want to say, September 1 to August 31 or something like that. And so 
if you work for a qualifying nonprofit organization, that federal money can be applied to 75% of, or up to 75% of the salary that that organization pays you. So that summer I worked for CalPhil and was paid primarily by federal money, mm. which is just reimbursed to the organization. The organization cuts you a check, but the, they essentially build the feds. Um, at the end of the summer, Cal Phil let me stay on until the end of the month and then politely let me go because at the time Cal Phil only did summer season and they always cut their staff back and they just didn't have the money. And But one of the, the last thing I did, the last big project I did after the summer season was over before I left was that I wrote a grant for Cal Phil to perform on the LA County holidays um, celebration. And that they generally hadn't had like professional orchestras and stuff because of the money issues um, playing on that, that um, thing. But it was the 40th anniversary, so they were devoting extra money to it. And Calfield got the grant. And so about two months later, Calfield called me back and asked me to come back to work for them doing development work primarily, and obviously there were going to be other duties and stuff, and I had stage managed Calfil's concerts, so that was going to be built into the next summer and everything, and from there I just worked for Calfil, I worked for Calfil for 10 years. Um, I had given the maestro a couple of CDs and a bunch of scores, and, you know, not, not elicited a great response from him, um, mainly because he's too busy to listen to him. But then one day I was working in the office and Maestro was touring somebody who I guess was like a professional, or a prospective sponsor or donor or something like that, through the office introducing everybody. And he introduced me as composer in residence. And that was the first time I ever knew that I was the composer in residence. And um, so, you know, he stuck to his guns and I was the composer in residence. I wrote a piece. Um, in summer of 2000, I graduated in 1999. So the first full year I was there, I was composing residence, and um, Meister had me write a piece that was a concerto for the percussion section and orchestra, and, and that was pretty successful. It was an expensive piece for the orchestra because you know the percussionist essentially had to have double instruments there, double cartridge, and everything. Um, but it was a lot of fun, and the next year I wrote. Um, a brief concert opener piece that, in my opinion, was a huge flop. Um, and that taught me a heck of a lot. Um, and then I wrote a piece every year thereafter, except for one year, plans for the orchestra got changed and my piece got postponed. And, um, but at that time, Calphil had also um, expanded to having um, concerts during the um, spring and winter. So my piece just got postponed by about nine months. Um, I, let's see, I wrote, I want to say, eight or nine orchestra pieces for Calphil. Probably eight. Um, one of them included choir and narrator. Um, and Calphil developed a chain music series, and I uh, wrote two chain music pieces for them, and they played it. No, I wrote three for that, and they played a fourth. So I've worked with all the musicians, you know, um, up close, and I also, having stage managed the, the shows, worked with all the featured artists, and I was the music librarian for a while, and I wrote grants, and I managed educational concerts, and um, I'm one of the few people that, ha and I worked, you know, with the sound reinforcement company for outdoor concerts, and I'm one of the few people that has the privilege of advising in my show on how the orchestra sounds from out in the hall and stuff like that. And Victor, my show, he's not just an artistic collaborator, he's not just a former boss, he's like family. He's a friend, you know, and a mentor and he's done great things to me. I will be forever grateful. And I think he's an awesome conductor, you know, like, and it's nice to be able to go into a rehearsal and Someone has taken the time and they know every single measure of your music backwards and forwards and um, pretty
pretty much every time I would give Victor a score, within 24 hours, he would call me back on the telephone and start asking me questions. <laughs> you know, rapid fire. Um, before I even had a chance to like find my score or whatever, he'd be asking me questions. And, like, I wasn't used to people doing that. And it's such an amazing thing. And I understand that part of that is that Cal Phil, like most professional orchestras, doesn't have very much rehearsal time. But the other part is, you know, that's his passion. And um, he digs into every single score and really, you know, gets the nuggets out. And he's, you know, said, well, I think you should change this. And there's been times when I've said, yes, you're right. And there's other times when I've said, no, I stick to my guns. And, you know, I, I don't remember which piece it was, but he was completely convinced that something I orchestrated was not going to sound right. And I was like, no, I know it's going to work, and it worked, you know. But there are other times it's like, you really don't want to do this. That's not going to sound right. And he was right. And I looked at the page, and I was like, yeah, you know what? I was so into just the notes. I didn't realize I wasn't making the effect that I wanted. So yeah, that's the relationship we have. I've taken care of his dog. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so you mentioned you uh, compose for choir. Yeah. How is that different from composing for instruments for you? Well whether it's a choir or a solo voice or an opera or whatever, the thing that's different is that you are dealing with words for one, but even more challenging is that you're um, writing for an instrument that the people that play it essentially don't have control over. I've been a professional choir boy, you know, and I've sung a few things and stuff, and no matter how um, firmly you have the idea of that sound and pitch and everything um, in your mind, sometimes your body just doesn't make it. Um, and, you know, we get really spoiled with modern technology, even with 19th century technology, that instruments can do some things very easily that voices can't. And if you don't, like, pay attention to what singers do and what they can do and work with them, you're going to write bad music because you don't write idiomatically. Um, which doesn't mean you shouldn't expand their boundaries, but you have to respect the fact that the body is um, changing all the time in ways that a violin or a flute or a timpani or whatever don't. Um, and if you're going to take the trouble to write for a voice and they're going to be singing or speaking or whatever, communicating a text, you have to also write to the text. What's the point of setting a text if people aren't going to understand it? Not just the actual words, but the emotional import and the sort of um, rhetorical thrust. So do you write the text or do you take text from other... I've done both. Okay. I um, had a great friend that I worked with um, in at CalArts, uh, who is who started getting her masters in visual art, and but she also did a lot of performance stuff, and she had always done a singer songwriter thing, and she actually started studying classical music for the first time in her life when she was getting her masters in art, and she ended up getting an interschool degree that was half music and half art, and um, her name is Julie Adler, and she has this just glorious voice that sort of halfway between opera and singer-songwriter that you would hear on the radio. And and she's not afraid to do anything performative or visual or whatever. And she was getting ready for her um, uh, final um, master's recital. And she asked me to write a piece for her. And it specifically, she asked for me to write a conducted piece because she hadn't done conducted music. She'd just done like sort of chamber music stuff and, um, you know, voice and piano, and I wrote a piece for her that I wrote the text for because there wasn't any text that was sort of, you know, nagging at me to set um, that was appropriate. I have sent, um, you know, poems, poems by fam famous poets, but also, like, when I was in um, Oklahoma finishing up my undergraduate degree, I had a friend who was an amazing poet. And um, she was suffering from rheumatoid arthritis that was killing her slowly. And um, she 
would publish her own poems. You know, it wasn't about money or anything. It was just something that she did that was like her lifelong love. And she gave me permission to set any of her poems that I ever wanted to. And she actually wrote me a poem as a birthday present. For a couple of years, she wrote me a poem as a birthday present. And the first one she wrote was um, so amazing. And I, that's the piece I set for chorus with Cal Phil. And I wanted to set that music for a long time, but I didn't want to just do voice and piano. I wanted to do something bigger because I felt that her text needed something bigger. And it was just, it was an amazing, amazing experience to, you know, you watch things on TV, uh, like say in a reality show or something, or somebody says, you know, like, my dead mother's watching me and I can feel it. That was when I had that experience. Mm -hmm. I knew Deborah was there even though she had died several years prior. So with all these pieces that you have composed for chamber music, orchestra, there must be some dedications, just like most composers dedicate pieces. Well, a large number of my pieces actually have sort of multiple dedications, because when I was with Cal Phil, um, one of the things that Cal Phil um, used as an opportunity to raise funds was dedication rights to my orchestra pieces at their annual fundraiser. So I would say probably every single piece I've ever written, barring maybe three or four, has some sort of two something. Because I tend to write music for specific people or groups. And I write to that, but often there are pieces that will have a dedicated to blah, 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 because that's been my gift to the orchestra was essentially selling that and it stays on the piece in perpetuity. Um, and I've had people that um, still come up to me and say, you know what? Being a part of your piece that way was so amazing for me. And I think about it all the time. I listen to your music and, you know, like it's a pretty humbling experience. Um, but yeah, you know, um, I've written pieces to Cal Phil, to the California Ear Unit, um, to individual players. Um, it's got to be just something. Um, but you know, there's times, there's always that time when you just write that piece because you have to do it for yourself. And it may not have, you know, a performance scheduled or performers in mind or anything, like, but that piece has to be written. Um, Sometimes it changes too, like I was an English horn player, that was, you know, essentially what I lived for for a long time. And so when I actually started to really get proud of my composing, I wrote a piece for English horn and piano and it was a piece that sort of um, was very, very important to me. And I had written like two thirds of it and because of changes in my life, moving from Oklahoma, going to Cal Arts, uh, studying with a teacher that didn't want to work with me while I was doing that kind of music, um, it got put on the shelf. And then when I revisited it um, and finished it, I ended up, you know, I could have, that could have been just the me piece, but I had a uh, friend that I was going to school with who was just an incredible English woman. Player. And I dedicated it to her, not only because she premiered it, but just because her playing was so amazing. And it made me really glad that I had given up playing because I knew I could never be where she is at. Um, you know, that's some, that weird thing, at least for me, about being a composer is I know I will never be a really good performer on any instrument because I know that there are things that I don't hear while I play mm. or, or while I sing. But I know that conversely, you know, there are things that I do musically or that my ears do or my mind does or whatever that other people don't do. And so my talents are about writing music and, you know, hopefully in the rehearsal process, collaborating with performers, you know, I can bring something to the table that they wouldn't necessarily get from what's on the page. So. A question that always interests me is how do you teach composition? How have you been taught composition? And if you teach, how do you teach it? Um, 
Well, the first thing that was taught to me in my first ever composition lesson, my teacher, uh, Evan Thompson, turned to me and said, the first thing, the most important part of any piece of music is the melody. And everything should come out of the melody. And I'm going to teach you a technique that my teacher taught me, and he studied with Ravel, and Ravel taught it to him. And so he taught me that technique, which was simply to think about, you know, melody, hear that melody in your mind, and to, on a piece of paper, doesn't have to be music paper, draw, simply draw dots in the sort of shape, curved shape of whatever that melody is. And then to, you know, go through the melody again in your head, sing it to yourself, whatever, and using those dots, which may or may not be right, you know, and you can fix them, right, do it again, and then do the line in between the dots and stuff. And then, and only then, after you really have the sort of graphic image of it, um, then and only then do you actually start putting pitches to it. And then after you put pitches to it, you put rhythm to it. And, um, and I used that technique for a long time until I developed my own way of working. Um, and which doesn't mean I don't use it every now and then still, because there are times. Um, my own personal working method, I think, just like everybody else's, evolves over time. But I have taught that exact technique to students many times. Um, I have um, taught students ranging from like five to 17. Um, and it's amazing how at what like developmental level people are able to grasp that or think that it's weird or whatever. Um, but once they get it, it's a very freeing technique. Um, the other thing about teaching composition is, in some ways, you really can't teach composition. Either people compose or they don't. Um, what you can do a lot of the time is ask them what their intent is and try to help them draw their intent out from the work. Um, I noticed that a lot of people that I was peers with in studying composition were really good at techniques and their music didn't say anything. And me personally, I could care less about technique. But I want my music to say something, and I want people to understand what I'm trying to say. And because of that, I was generally the first amongst my peers to be recognized as having a style and having pieces that people wanted to listen to again. It's not to denigrate people, you know, um, but it's to say that to me, the most important thing is what you say and how you say it as far as the sort of meaning behind it. Not what you say and how you say it as close to notes and marks on a page or, you know, how you get the sound out of your vibraphone or whatever. Um, and when I have worked with students, I've tried to do that. One of, one of the other things that, that Mr. Thompson taught me when I first was starting to compose, it's like beginning composers repeat the same thing over and over again because they don't know any better. And um, that was an amazing lesson because it's true. But you have to go through that. And so what you teach people is very little. And simply by doing that, I've seen people come up with whole other ideas. And you know, obviously that works for myself too. But to see that light bulb turn on, because usually they're very resistant to it, you know, because it's, I just, this is my first piece or whatever, and I'm so proud of it, you know, like, the hard thing about teaching, especially beginning, beginning composers, is criticizing people in a way that helps them rather than hurts them. Um, but once they get past that and try it, their lights turn on and they go do all sorts of other great things. Tell you one other thing that Mr. Thompson taught me when I was first composing, and this is a story. It's funny, but it's actually very true. Um, so I was composing, and I would compose in the practice rooms downstairs, basement of the Seratine Center, um, 
at OSU, and um, Mr. Thompson told me, don't show any of your friends what you're working on. Don't play it for them. Don't tell them about it. And um, he was like, it'll ruin it. You're not at a stage where you can do that. And I was working on an orchestra piece because there was a competition kind of thing um, amongst universities in the same sports conference that we were all in for composers. And the prize was you got a reading. So he was like, you know, you really haven't studied composers long enough. I normally wouldn't ask anybody to write an orchestra piece, but there's this opportunity and you should take yourself, uh, you should avail yourself of it. And so I was writing this piece and I had a friend who was a flute major. And her name was Anne. And she knocked on my practice room door while I was composing at the piano and insisted that she come in and, and just would not relent. I had to play my piece for her. I had to show it to her. And you know, I protested and protested and protested, protested. But I'm not a very confrontational person, so of course I gave in. And I had my score out, you know, writing in pencil by hand and everything, and took her through it and I have very little piano skills, so sort of faking my way through it and describing it and everything. And and got this big smile on her face and she said, and I think you should call it soil. And I was like, soil? <laughs> why do you think that? And so she started telling me, you know, um, why she thought it was called soil based on what I had demonstrated for her. And, you know, that piece that was going to be you know, this piece was going to open doors for me. I was going to get a performance by orchestra and everything. Like, that was the line demarcation when that piece died. <laughs> and um, so for the long time, the longest time, I had a, a joke amongst my friends that that was a soil comment. Um, and yeah, so that's the other thing I teach, teach students. Don't show your work until you have enough pieces under your belt that you're, you know, um, comfortable being a composer. Because the weird thing is, is that at least in America, we generally teach people how to speak music, how to play it. We don't teach people how to write it, and nobody knows how. And um, so they don't, they not only don't know the technical aspects of how to write it, but they don't know what to say. What, what we've t taught people to do generally is to repeat. Now, obviously, you bring personality and everything else when you're, you know, performing whether it's something that you're coming up with on the spot or something you practiced for 60 hours or whatever. But as a system, we don't, it's the it's weirdest thing. You teach people how to write a language. You teach people how to write math, you know, but you don't teach people how to write music. And so you get people that are very talented and have been practicing musicians for years that that's the place they're most vulnerable because that's the one thing they've never been taught. And so, uh, because of my experience, because of what Mr. Thompson taught me, that you know, you've got to keep those cards close to your chest until you've developed a level of comfort with it. So, we heard a lot about the compositions and all that you've done in music. What do you do outside of music? Hobbies, activities, or interests? I walk my dog. Um, gee, what else? Well, I'm very active in, in my faith. Um, and I uh, do the Silva Method meditation practice, and I love to cook, and I love to eat, and hang out with friends, you know? I you know, work for an entertainment company and some restaurants, so lifestyle stuff happens a lot, you know? I have the luxury of getting to enjoy, you know, fine wine and spirits and fine food and stuff like that often for free as, as work, which is really cool. Um, and because I work for an entertainment company, I get to go to a lot of events. Um, I also like to just like, you know, go be out in nature. This is something I ask to every composer because some get inspired, some have a schedule. What's your composition schedule? Do you have a schedule like mornings, nights, or do you just compose whenever you want? <laughs> The deadline is the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> it seems no. like that's the answer I get a lot. <laughs> um, I, I am a firm believer in uh, perspiration rather than inspiration. If I sit down to work, I do the work. Um, 
when I was in school, I would compose at all hours of the day and night. Now that I'm older, I compose at all hours of the day and the night, but I don't deprive myself of sleep like I used to. Mm. Um, I, I guess that's it. You know, I, I don't have a formula for um, not just time, but like what part of the work gets done or whatever. I used to be really like, I only write the notes now and I do all the expressions and everything else later. I don't do that anymore. Um, but day or night, as long as I'm well rested and awake, I can write music. What are your current projects? Any projects coming up? Um, revising my symphony. And it's possible I'm actually going to be collaborating with some friends on a jazz tune for an upcoming CD. Um, and I really, really, really want to write an English horn concerto. Something that's not been done too often. Yeah, you know, I'm, I, I, I went through a long phase where I sort of didn't like being a musician in the sense that like, I didn't listen to music. I, I like, if I listen to the radio, I listen to like news and talk and, and stuff like that. And, um, I mean, I loved writing music and I loved rehearsing music and stuff, but like music wasn't a part of my daily life so much. Um, but I'm back into that and I don't know, midlife crisis or whatever, but like I'm really revisiting a lot of things from when I was an Ovo, an English horn player and stuff like that. And um, seeing where that has changed, you know, new repertoire and stuff like that. Um, and that, if I had the opportunity, that would be one of the things I would do. Um, it would be nice to, I wrote a soprano sax concerto when I was at CalArts. It would be really nice to um, make a, a that was like a first soprano sax and chamber ensemble. It'd be really nice to make a um, large orchestra version of that. Um, but you know, pretty much, if you give me the opportunity, I can write for it. Barring the fact that I don't want, I wrote an opera when I was in undergraduate school, and I spent a year and a half on it. I don't want to do that kind of long-term project again. Like, it's, you know, an opera is all-consuming and I don't think that I have the theater genius to make that all-consuming um, endeavor worthwhile. I think if I was really better attuned to that kind of drama and everything it would be worth it and there are people that are great at it you know but I'm not so sure I'm one of those people. So what other music do you listen to or is it just classical music? I listen to a lot of jazz. Um, I listen to a lot of 80s pop, um, and yeah, pretty much, I, I, you know, and I have a pretty narrow focus when it comes to classical music too. Mm. My big thing has always been that I'm an American composer and I listen to American classical music. Mm. There was a long time where I did not allow Beethoven in my household. Um, because I could always turn on the radio and that stuff would be on there. Yeah. You know, obviously, you know, things like that, they wear off, you know, and I have some great Beethoven recordings that I love um, and stuff. But I primarily listen to American stuff. That's what I draw my inspiration from. And uh, lastly, I would like to ask, a question about the youth and the next generation since a lot of programs, music programs are being cut from public schools and private schools also. Uh, what would you suggest to... Revolt, demand, <laughs> because you know what? All these cuts and everything are, you know, the, the idea of privatization, that's just giving money to companies that should be given to the people because the people paid for it. Um, and you know what? Bureaucratic salaries are not sacred. The purpose of bureaucracy is to support things, and we tend to have that backwards. We tend to support the bureaucracy and cut the programs. It's dumb. And whether it's music, whether it's visual art, whether it's physical education, or whatever, like you just can't you can't do what we've been doing. The model has become untenable. And, and system doesn't work anymore. And 
Yeah, students need to demand their rights. They need to be heard. They need to talk to their parents. They need to talk to the administrators. And, um, gee, I, you know, I would have killed myself when I was young had it not been for music. It literally saved my life. And I can't imagine what struggling kids are that don't have an outlet of, of any kind because it's been gutted from school. I don't understand how they hang on. Um, you know, if there are other ways to do it, Boys and Girls Club, churches, you know, social organizations, whatever, that's great. Go to a pawn shop and buy the cheapest instrument you can, you know, but do something and demand your rights. That's the most important thing, demand your rights. Thank you, Roger, for joining Opus 93. Hopefully we'll have you again in the future. Tigran, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.